I do hope you can see me today from where you are. In May 1991, Queen Elizabeth made Congress laugh. With that opening line, Her Majesty the Queen brought down the House of Representatives. Why the uproarious silliness when the Queen addressed Congress? And why is that the opening line for this podcast, too? We explain in this special British-flavored episode as C-SPAN's The Weekly marks the Queen's passing by traveling back to May 1991 when she visited Washington, D.C. Several British prime ministers have addressed Congress. Clement Attlee, Margaret Thatcher, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, Winston Churchill. Churchill, in fact, a whopping three times the most of any foreign leader or dignitary speaking to the House and Senate. But only one time has British royalty addressed Congress. May 16, 1991, Queen Elizabeth. Before we dive into her speech, let's explain her opening joke, a classic from the School of British Wit. We need to back up two days, the Queen's arrival ceremony at the White House on May 14th. It was her third state visit to the United States, the prior to October 1957 with President Eisenhower and July 1976 for the U.S. Bicentennial with President Ford. On May 14, 1991, she was greeted by President George H.W. Bush. Mr. President, thank you for your warm welcome to Washington and to the White House. We are both delighted to be back in the United States and to find you in the best of health. It gives me particular pleasure that this visit comes so soon after a vivid and effective demonstration of the long-standing alliance between our two countries. Warm words, but here is what was most memorable about that ceremony. You couldn't see her. Her Majesty's face was obscured by microphones. The five-foot-four-inch queen was called the talking hat after she stepped up to a lectern so tall that only her broad-brimmed hat was visible to TV viewers. Hence, two days later, that opening joke to Congress as she stood high above on the rostrum. On C-SPAN's call show, Meryl Hartson, congressional correspondent for the Associated Press, described the scene. Of course, one of the greatest moments yesterday was when the Queen opened her speech to the Joint Session of Congress, noting to her audience that uh, she was pleased that they could see her. This plays to one of the interesting developments earlier in the week on Monday on the White House lawn, when because of uh, some kind of a protocol faux pas, uh, what uh, the, the Queen's face was barely visible to television cameras and still cameras, and what uh, most people saw was her hat. With that self-deprecating incident skillfully dispensed with, the Queen got serious. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, distinguished members of Congress, I know what a rare privilege it is to address a joint meeting of your two houses. Thank you for inviting me. The concept, so simply described by Abraham Lincoln, as government by the people, of the people, for the people, is fundamental to our two nations. Your Congress and our Parliament are the twin pillars of our civilizations and the chief among the many treasures that we have inherited from our predecessors. We, like you, are staunch believers in the freedom of the individual and the rule of a fair and just law. These principles are shared with our European partners and with the wider Atlantic community. They are the bedrock of the Western world. Queen Elizabeth's speech came less than three months after coalition forces defeated Iraq in the Persian Gulf War. Her language reflected the moment. Some people believe that power grows from the barrel of a gun. So it can, but history shows that it never grows well, nor for very long. Force in the end is sterile. We have gone a better way. Our societies rest on mutual agreement, on contract, 
and on consensus. A significant part of your social contract is written down in your constitution. Ours rests on custom and will. The spirit behind both, however, is precisely the same. It is the spirit of democracy. During her lifetime, Queen Elizabeth met 13 U.S. presidents, starting with Harry Truman when she was a 25-year-old princess. In 1951, she and her husband, Prince Philip, stayed with the Trumans at Blair House, where the Trumans lived during a White House renovation. In her 1991 address to Congress, the Queen cited, from 10 years earlier, the president who immediately preceded Truman, 50 years before her speech. In 1941, President Roosevelt spoke of freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. Freedom of every person to worship God in their own way everywhere in the world. Freedom from want and freedom from fear. Just as our societies have prospered through their reliance on contract, not force, so too will the world be a better place for the spread of that mutual respect and good faith which are so fundamental to our way of life. Freedom under the rule of law is an international as well as a national concern. That day, the Queen had at least one detractor inside Congress from a Kennedy. Here's Representative Joseph Kennedy, Democrat from Massachusetts, just after Queen Elizabeth spoke in the chamber. Mr. Speaker, Queen Elizabeth addressed the Congress today, and I and several of my colleagues were absent to protest the British occupation in the north of Ireland. For the British people, the Queen represents a long line of tradition, but for many in Northern Ireland, she is a reminder of a long and painful occupation by British forces. While the Queen was here, the first round of talks aimed at achieving peace in Northern Ireland remained stalled. These potential talks remain, uh, <coughs> raised the hopes of progress, but after two decades under siege, many obstacles remain clear impediments to the hope of peace. The primary obstacle is a British occupation in the north of Ireland. It represents a human rights and economic tragedy that has partitioned a people and a nation. This policy has eroded the fundamental principles of democracy in both England and Ireland and has sowed the seeds of hatred, mistrust, and discrimination. One historic footnote, a few months after the Queen was in America, British Prime Minister John Major also visited the United States, but he didn't get to speak to Congress. On August 29, 1991, Major met with President Bush at his home in Kennebunkport, Maine. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I'd like firstly to thank the President and Mrs. Bush for their invitation uh, to join them here today. Norma Elizabeth and I have had a great time and we're very grateful to you for making us feel as much at home in New England as we do in our England and we're grateful to you for that. Can only imagine Queen Elizabeth delivering that line with a little more British punch. And now a bonus clip. The month after Queen Elizabeth visited Washington, D.C., June 1991, Christopher Hitchens, the late and legendary swashbuckling British journalist, wrote about her. Here's an exchange from the October 17, 1993 Book Notes program on C-SPAN. You'll hear mention of Norman Schwarzkopf, a much celebrated general from the Persian Gulf War. The nation, June 1991. What the hell did General Norman Schwarzkopf think he was doing when he accepted, while he was still a senior serving officer, a knighthood from Queen Elizabeth II? Yes. A question I could never get him or anyone at the Pentagon to answer. The Constitution of the United States, which I am, um, well consecrated to admiring um, because I come from a country that doesn't have a constitution and so I, I think I appreciate it maybe more than people take it for granted. Very clearly says that um, American uh, serving officials shall not take decorations or titles of honor from any foreign uh, monarch or head of state and there was Schwarzkopf being knighted by Queen Elizabeth. I thought what is this we're supposed to have a republic here and a republic of laws at that and I can't stand it when people think that the highest honor that can come to them is to be allowed to sprawl at the feet of the House of Windsor, which is uh, a dysfunctional royal family that is now pretty much discredited even in England. By the way, General Schwarzkopf also addressed Congress May 8, 1991, eight days before Queen Elizabeth. And now a rare bonus bonus clip. We open with a laugh from Queen Elizabeth in Congress. Let's close with a laugh from Tony Blair in Congress. 
The British Prime Minister had just been awarded a Congressional Gold Medal when he addressed a joint meeting of Congress. On July 17, 2003, Tony Blair began this way. Mr. Speaker, sir, my thrill on receiving this award was only a little diminished on being told that the first Congressional Gold Medal was awarded to George Washington for what Congress called his wise and spirited conduct in getting rid of the British out of Boston. <laughs> On our way down here, Senator Frist was kind enough to show me the, the fireplace where in 1814 the British had burnt the Congress Library. I know this is kind of late, but sorry. <laughs> That's it for this episode of C-SPAN's The Weekly, where it's never too late to dive into the C-SPAN video library. The Brits might have burned the Congress Library, but they can't touch the C-SPAN Library. It's all online. Just go to cspan.org and use the search bar on top. You'll have a jolly good time finding lots of coverage of British politics and British leaders. And if King Charles follows in the footsteps of his mother and also addresses Congress, you can clip that old chap too. Thanks for listening. Drive on the correct side of the road and happy searching.